Oh, hello there. Welcome back to my series of book collection videos, and this time we'll be continuing with my shelves of various motion picture and entertainment biographies and uh, subjects. So picking up uh, alphabetically with the letter F, this is my only book I currently own dealing with Errol Flynn. This is a really great book. It's a, actually a memoir of sorts by uh, a really great stuntman who became a close friend of Flynn's, uh, especially later on in his life. So this is My Days with Errol Flynn uh, by Buster Wiles, uh, aforementioned uh, stuntman and stand-in for Errol, and then basically became close friends, and this is just filled with all kinds of fun misadventures. Um, of course, Errol's autobiography, My Wicked, Wicked Ways, is just essential um, but I haven't gotten one of the really nice later reissue copies yet. But uh, basically anything dealing with Errol, I practically devour. Um, there's a really great book um, out there about Errol. Um, it's pretty much, I believe, called his uh, Films in Career or Life in Career uh, from McFarland. And all McFarland books are usually great, but super, super expensive. But this is a really nice memoir. If, if you're interested in Errol or a fan of uh, Errol Flynn and you just haven't read this one yet. This next one is an example of, uh, you know, actually look at the book before you pick it up. Uh, I picked this up thinking, uh, you know, I, because there was a sticker over the name, uh, thinking it was a biography or autobiography of the actor Edward Fox, but it turns out it was actually the uh, actor James Fox. So I haven't gotten to read this yet, but this was just another thrift store find, and it looks like a, a nice memoir and um, pretty much picking up uh, from his you know early days of course childhood days and then uh, starting his uh, rise to you know somewhat stardom with film performance. This is a lovely essential tome. Uh, anything written by Scott Iman is usually going to be well worth your time. Uh, he's done a number of great film biographies about luminaries and legends and uh, really knocks it out of the park every time. Um, in this case I think uh, this book is maybe slightly eclipsed by the massive tome that is Joseph McBride's book on Ford, uh, which I really want to get a nice hardcover copy of. But uh, I found this in a local shop. I've read it in the library more than once, uh, but couldn't pass up a nice copy of Iman's book on Ford, entitled, of course, Print the Legend, after the famous line from The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. So if you're just getting into Ford for the first time and you're looking for a good uh, book on Ford overall, this, this is a nice well-researched, well-written read, as all of Iman's books are. Uh, again, I think it's only eclipsed by uh, Joe McBride's Searching for John Ford because that's just massive. It's about twice the length of this, but this is still a nice, hefty book, and I love the cover design. So if you're looking for a good Ford biography, but you're not quite willing to go all the way with uh, McBride's book, uh, this is probably going to be the one for you. And then also, I have a nice updated copy of uh, Dan Ford's memoir and semi-biography about Ford entitled Pappy, which was uh, a nickname given to Ford by a lot of other people. Um, Dan Ford being, of course, uh, Ford's grandson, and uh, he started putting this together before Ford died, and so there was a little bit of participation, and it's filled with interviews and anecdotes from uh, various cast and crew members, of course, who were still living at the time. And um, this is, like I said before, it's slightly updated, so and it's got a ton of great stills. Um, it's very common to find the original printing, but uh, definitely look for this later one. It's got a little bit of extra material that was written uh, after Ford's death and uh, after the first edition. This next one is one I really want to dig into. I just haven't got to read yet. Um, it's by Lee Server, who wrote the amazing book on uh, Robert Mitchum. Uh, which is one of the best biographies on, on an actor I've ever read. So uh, when I saw this, I picked it up. It's a really nice-looking tome on Ava Gardner uh, entitled Love is Nothing. So this is one I simply picked up because I was really impressed with Server's work on the Mitchum book, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet. It's called Baby, I Don't Care, of course. Um, but yeah, I love the cover design on here, and this is just one on... Uh, my giant pile of books to read I haven't gotten to yet. And then because I can't pass up a cheap biography, I have two books on uh, Sir John Gielgud. Uh, this one is entitled The Authorized Biography, and I haven't got to read either of these yet, so I'm, I'm not sure which is technically better. But this has a nice matte finish cover, nice photo image and stuff, 
And of course, you know, if you want to read about the luminaries of the stage and screen, you know, there's no better place to start with the, uh, than with the great British thespians. And then this much thicker tome, entitled Matinee Idol to Movie Star, is the other book on Gilgood I picked up. And this thing is, it's really massive. Like this is a <laughs> real tome uh, from a, and it's actually from a, a real drama publisher. So I'm sure this one seems like it's it's going to be much more in depth, but uh, again, I can't pass up cheap biographies. Then of course, I have to have a bunch of books on Cary Grant because what actor shelf would be complete without a bunch of books on Grant? And there's, there's quite a lot out there. Um, this one's more recent. This is a memoir uh, by his uh, former wife, of course, Diane Cannon, uh, entitled Dear Carrie. So it's about their uh, years together, and and um, it's written not not too terribly long ago, like in the early uh, 2010s, I believe. But uh, yeah, it's just one of the uh, you know memoirs that pop up about. Uh, you know, one of the famous stars, but at least it's from somebody who, you know, who actually knew them intimately. <laughs> so um, just something I added for my uh, grant shelf of books. This is another one. Um, this one is by, um, well, it's, it's actually by two people, but it's by a, uh, by a photographer and a writer who actually worked with Grant later on in his life. So again, about a book about Grant written by people who actually knew him, uh, you know, on a more personal or professional basis. So this one's simply entitled An Affair to Remember, uh, My Life with Cary Grant. And it's a, it's a nice little tome, and it's nice to get information about his later years when, you know, he was no longer acting on screen post his retirement, but he was still doing things like uh, being on the board for uh, Fabergé, for example. So it's always nice to get personal insights from people who actually knew certain luminaries or individuals you're fascinated with instead of just the usual mumbo-jumbo and anecdotes and stuff. Speaking of which, we come to this next book, which sold a ton of copies back in the day, but I have to say, this is definitely not the book I would recommend people go for because um, this this writer has a habit of um, writing books about uh, actors in particular that usually go off into just anecdote and hearsay territory, and this one is no exception. I read this when it came out, and um, it took me reading a lot of other books to realize that a lot of the stuff in here is just not really um, accurate or is conjecture. And that's uh, Mark Elliott's uh, Grant biography, which the cover is beautiful. I love the cover designs of all the biographies that he writes. And I remember when this came out, this just a beautiful cover. Fortunately, this is a used paperback. It's a little dinged up and such, but still great cover. Not, not a very good book. Um, if you're really hardcore uh, as a Cary Grant fan like I am, then you kind of have to read this at least once and go through it, but just, just keep in mind it's not really that great of a biography, but I still love the cover a whole lot. And then uh, probably the best of the personal memoirs, uh, this is actually a book entitled Good Stuff, written by uh, Grant's daughter, Jennifer, about uh, her, her days with her dad, essentially. And it's just a wonderful, warm tome, you know, not, not, not a particularly long read, but just a really nice uh, book of personal remembrances. And then lastly, this one kind of goes hand in hand with the Affair to Remember book. Uh, but this one, uh, you know, also written by people who worked with Grant in his later years. Um, this is primarily dealing with the lecture tour that he did towards the very end of his life, um, where he would just basically go around the country doing Q&A sessions with people. And it was just, you know, a fun evening of conversation. Um, so this is written by the person that kind of was in charge of that and then is, uh, you know, full of reminiscences from that, from those tours. So it's entitled Evenings with Cary Grant. And again, you wouldn't think that there's a lot of information in here, but it's actually a really great, really informative read. And in, in a way, all of these books kind of give you more of a sense of, of the actual person instead of just the star persona. Then this last one is a book... Uh, that's part of an old series from the 70s about uh, various uh, screen stars, but it's basically a miniature biography with a lot of nice vintage stills, and the printing in here is very good. 
So, of course, when I found it in you know, <laughs> a, a bin of cheap used books, I picked it up. The cover is a little bit worn, but it's not bad. So this is from the Pictorial Treasury of Film Stars, the book on Grant. And as you can see, it's stylized, so it obviously is part of a longer-running series. And I found a lot of these um, books, not only do they have great stills, but they have great, actually intelligent write-ups outside of the usual uh, studio biography um, crap, which was usually made up uh, very fancifully so. Um, and a lot of these books, you know, they've, they've never been reprinted, but as you can see, you know, there's, there's a lot of great stills, and uh, the, the text in here is actually quite good. So, of course, this isn't like, you know, one of those really great critical thesis books of the 70s or a book of Cahiers du Cinema pieces. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a really nice little, little book on Grant and his films and has a lot of stills, especially from the lesser known films. So these next two books are um, memoirs by Charles Grodin that I picked up simply because I really like his shtick and style and, and a number of comedies that he's been in throughout the years. So this first one is called uh, We're Ready for You, Mr. Grodin. Um, and these are fun little whimsical books of remembrances, not, you know, a full-out autobiography. And then the second one, written a number of years later, is entitled How I Got to Be whoever it is I am. So the title should give you a kind of sense of the sort of whimsical, self-deprecating tone of these books. And they're, they're you know, fun to read through, you know, at least once or twice just to, you know, have something different to read. So these next two are because I'm a giant Top Gear fan, I should say original Top Gear slash Grand Tour. Um, so I picked up and read uh, Richard Hammond's memoir, which was written uh, post his recovery from his near-fatal crash that was done on the show when he was testing this crazy rocket car. And, of course, if you're a fan of Top Gear, you're obviously a, a fan of the three presenters. And, uh, you know, I, I love them all to death. And uh, we all watch the show primarily because of how fun they um, they make it by just totally taking the piss out of each other the whole time. So um, this is this is a fun little memoir, and it reveals you know just just how close he came to not making it, and how uh, crazy the long recovery process was. And then there's also uh, this second volume that's basically another memoir of sorts. Again, not a full autobiography, uh, simply entitled "Or Is That Just Me?" And uh, there's a bunch of stickers included, I guess, to uh, reference uh, Jeremy's always referring to him as the fridge magnet of the three. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the most well-regarded tome on this person, but uh, it just looked like such a fun book. And it, this is one of those people that I could, again, listen to uh, even if they were just reading the phone book, and it's fascinating. So uh, this is uh, entitled A Man Called Harris on uh, Richard Harris, of course. And it's just one of those people that I find so fascinating. So I'm looking forward to actually getting to reading this. But I do like the cover design. And again, it's got this nice uh, matte finish to it, which is always a, a nice touch. Uh, this next one, uh, it's, it's actually a really great book because there's not a whole lot of information out there on this person's life outside of the, the famous sketches and things. So this is the biography of Phil Hartman entitled You Might Remember Me. Um, if you've ever wanted to know more about Phil and uh, his tragic death or even his uh, days at SNL and stuff, this is a great source. It's a wonderfully written book um, about somebody who really, even though they were well-regarded, he was very well-regarded, he, he still really is quite underrated, I think. Um, and, of course, you know, his life was cut far short. Um, so... Um, this is just a great book if you've ever wanted to know more about Phil Hartman and his career. So very, very highly recommended. Now, this next one is one of the essential tomes. This is one of the the first like major thick film biographies I was able to find, let alone read in a library. I've read this countless times, and it's it's really one of those essential ones. So this is Todd McCarthy's book on Howard Hawks entitled The Gray Fox of Hollywood. Uh, if you haven't read this and you're just getting into Hawks, please just go ahead and read this. Just find it at your local library or buy a copy. I love the cover art design, and I've always loved that the spine actually has the name spelled out in really big letters, so it's like a big, bold statement. And then the rear has an overlay of Hawks behind all the uh, critical blurbage. But this is just, it's the book on Hawks. It's nice and thick, so it is a full-on tome 
Um, this is essential reading. Hawks is one of the great American directors, one of the great directors, period. So uh, you, you can't go wrong with this book. So next up are a whole bunch of books on the Hepburns, uh, both Audrey and Catherine Hepburn, because you know both are intensely fascinating subjects, and it seems everybody and their brother has written a book on them. So um, you know, every once in a while, if I see a new one or I find one in the library, I, I read it, and yet it's another biography. And sometimes they differ because certain authors just you print the hearsay and such, and then sometimes you're just reading the same biography and just one's a bit more detailed and one's a bit more sketchy. Uh, so I'm just going to go through these really, really quickly by um, uh, alphabetized by author. Um, this one, at least from what I remember, I think this is probably the best book if you're just looking for a good Audrey Hepburn biography. So uh, this is the Barry Paris book simply entitled Audrey Hepburn. And really nice cover, again, matte printing. And I really enjoy on this cover how they have one of the you know famous glamour-style shots of Audrey. And then on the back, they have her in her uh, later days when she was working for UNICEF as a goodwill ambassador. So I do like that they have both on the cover and they don't just, you know, print the glamour photos on there. This is a really well-written book. It is, you know, pretty hefty. And it goes through not just her tumultuous life as a child uh, surviving through the Second World War and then her days in Hollywood and stuff, but it also goes into a really nice detail about her later days, which most books really don't get into that as much. So if you're looking for just one book on Audrey, I think this is probably the best one that I've read. Now this one I haven't read quite yet, but uh, the author is one of those that I have a lot of issues with, um, primarily due to um, his, his books on Hitchcock and how that's kind of colored the uh, academic studies of Hitchcock for a number of decades. But, um, you know, I've read some of his other books on famous celebrities, but he seems to write books on very famous celebrities because everybody knows they'll sell well. But this is the Donald's photo book on Audrey, uh, simply entitled Enchantment. I haven't got to read this one yet, but I found this copy super cheap in the local used shop. And again, the cover is very nice. It's one of these fancy trade paperbacks. So I'm going to read this, but um, usually not a fan of Spoto's writing. So I'll, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. But I still think the uh, Paris book is probably the best one. Um, I remember reading this in the library a number of years ago. So it's, it's been a long while, but uh, this is the Alexander Walker book on Audrey Hepburn. And uh, it's definitely slimmer than the Paris book, but I remember it being pretty good and pretty informative. So this is probably another uh, good book to check out. Uh, Walker is one of the great British film critics, um, and he's done some biographies like this. So it's, it's a good read, but again, it's been a long while since I've actually read this. But again, I think the, uh, the Paris book is probably the best one. So next up are all of the books on Katie Hepburn that I have. And yeah, I, I say Katie, it's just how my head works. I've seen so many of her, of her, of her films. Ugh, wow. I've seen so many of her films and read so many of these books that, you know, you get to a point where, not to sound weird, but every time I think of Katherine Hepburn, I think Katie Hepburn. So that's that's just well, that's what that comes out. Uh, so this is Hepburn's uh, autobiography. Um, well, I should say the her first memoir, but this is The Making of the African Queen with the wonderful subtitle of How I Went to Africa with Bogart, Bacall, and Houston and Almost Lost My Mind. Uh, this was also included in some of the um, limited releases of the African Queen, like the big Laserdisc box set got a slimmed down version of this. But this is the really nice hardcover that uh, has loads of stills and if you're at all a fan of the african queen you have to read this because it's just you can't put it down it's just it's incredible to hear of all of the craziness that went on on the set because you know they went off in the middle of the jungle and made this and i love the front piece here as well so this is one of those essential making of memoir books and then later on, of course, she actually did write her autobiography, which is entitled simply Me, <laughs> Stories of My Life. Uh, if you're a fan of Hepburn, you've probably already read this or heard of it. Um, it's definitely a essential read. 
Um, but like most autobiographies, it's not going to be exactly the same as getting, you know, a pure, hard-hitting uh, biography written from a um, outside uh, third-party source. But still, just essential reading because not everybody actually sat down and wrote an autobiography. And if they did, it's usually a slim memoir and not a pretty hefty tome. And then I've also got a uh, memoir of uh, one of her friends in her later years who wrote this book entitled Kate Remembered. Uh, so this, again, is one of those, uh, you know, personal remembrances slash memoirs of uh, a close friend writing about a great luminary figure. So um, I remember this being pretty good, but again, it's been a little while since I've read it. And then jumping into the number of biographies out there, and trust me, this is just a, a handful. But if again, if I see a cheap biography, I, I I I buy it. I can't help it, even if I've already read it or I already have multiple books on the same subject, because I think I honestly have more books on Katie Hepburn than almost anybody, save uh, Hitchcock and Kubrick. Um, so anyway, this is uh, the Charlotte Chandler book, who's written a number of these biographies, and uh, they're always pretty good. Um, and I love the cover on this. So this is, I know where I'm going. Uh, this is Chandler's biography on uh, Catherine Hepburn. And again, the cover art is really great. So is the wraparound art and then the rear. So again, if you're looking for a nice, simple, single biography book on uh, Katie Hepburn, then you know this is probably a decent place to start. Uh, this one I haven't read yet, but this is another one. This one by Anne Edwards entitled uh, Catherine Hepburn, A Remarkable Woman. So there's this one, which, again, I've still got to read. And seems a, a bit thicker, but this is a smaller paperback. Um, this one I also have not read yet, but it's definitely on the thicker side. This is the uh, Barbara Leeming biography, simply titled Catherine Hepburn. So um, I will read these, but I usually try to spread out reading biographies of the same subject because otherwise you get real <laughs> overload. Um, but uh, yeah, simple cover design, but again, I'm going to read through this soon at some point. Now, this one I did read, and uh, it, at first, you know, I was about halfway through it. it. It seemed very interesting, but a lot of people have some issues with this because, again, there is a bit of, you know, hearsay printed as fact and things like that. But it's still a very thick volume with interesting cover art and, you know, good sections, I suppose. But then, you know, the rest of it is not so good. <laughs> I wish I'd realized that going in before I read the whole thing. But this is the uh, William Mann book uh, simply entitled Kate, the woman who was Hepburn. And I think I kind of got suckered in because the art is really cool. And then the spine has this really uh, cool kate on the side so you know exactly what it is on the shelf but yeah this is probably the one i would not recommend or read uh you know after you read some of the other ones but it's still a nice big thick book with a really nice cover art job and this next one is it's it's related this is actually about uh the catherine hepburn spencer tracy relationship uh, entitled an affair to remember by christopher anderson and i haven't read this one yet but this was just a random find I hadn't realized there was an entire uh, biography-style book simply on uh, their relationship together. And um, so, yeah, I'm interested to read through this because, of course, this runs through all of the biographies I've read and also the biographies of Tracy I've read. But I didn't know somebody had written an entire book about uh, their story together. So, yeah, I'm excited to read through this. Um, I may read this first before I read another one of these biographies. Well, this next one's kind of fun because it's literally reprintings of uh, this person's journal, um, but it covers the the most famous, most major years of their Hollywood career. And again, I found a cheap copy in a local bookstore. So um, I picked this up for finding out about certain films, but uh, it's, it's really an interesting read. Uh, so this is uh, Charlton Heston's series of journals entitled An Actor's Life that covers the years of uh, 1956 to 1976. So this covers everything from the Ten Commandments to uh, Touch of Evil, Major Dundee, and of course Planet of the Apes, among many others. So uh, that's the reason why I, I, I picked this up, because I just wanted to read through and leaf through about uh, those films. Uh, actually, Major Dundee most of all, because that was such a troubled production. Um, and of course, Touch of Evil. 
but uh, it's it's an interesting read, and it kind of puts you in the mindset of a good old Chuck. Um, and again, not not common that people would actually reprint um, their actual journals. And as you can see, that's literally what this is. So I, I do like getting firsthand, uh, you know, at the time sources, which is really really cool. So it's like getting a personal version uh, and standpoint of a production report. And then I do have a copy of his autobiography, which was written, I believe, in the late 1990s called In the Arena, which, again, nice cover. And then the back has a picture or a still from Ben-Hur. Um, of course, I personally, I, you know, I don't agree politically with, uh, you know, his, his later views, um, you know, in his older years. But, of course, not everybody's going to agree about everything. That's what makes life interesting. But uh, it is a, a, a well-written book, and uh, again, the insight in here is really good, and particularly about each individual film and his uh, background as a stage actor as well. So, you know, it, it's an interesting book, um, one of the better autobiographies of an actor that I've read. So now we're going to get into another major part of my shelves, all my books on Alfred Hitchcock. So again, going alphabetically by author, this is a really, really great book, and I'd say very important for understanding uh, not only Hitchcock for his technique, but also his uh, work ethics and his mentality about motion picture making. So this is by Dan Ollier, who's written a number of great books, uh, simply entitled Hitchcock's Notebooks. And again, this, this is just priceless for the material in here. So not only do you have reproductions of the hand-drawn storyboards, but you have all kinds of production reports, script excerpts, and uh, broken down into individual chapters. So Aldi basically got access to, uh, you know, library and vault collection materials and composed this book based around all of this production material. And then, for example, this is a breakdown of sequences in Young and Innocent. As you can see, the, the attention to detail here is just really exceptional. And again, this is one of the books that doesn't get covered as often, and it really deserves to be. So if, if you're a Hitchcock fan and you haven't read this yet, uh, please definitely seek this out. It's one of the best ways to understand uh, Hitchcock's real uh, work, work mentality. And that's really the most important thing uh, in understanding uh, how any creative person works. And again, the, the number of stills and reproductions and script excerpts in here is just astounding. And if there's any critical book on Hitchcock out there, I pick it up even if I hate it later on, um, especially if I find it cheap. So I, I always dig through the TV cinema shelves at uh, any uh, bookstore. So this one is an interesting critical book uh, entitled The Hitchcock Romance, Subtitle, Love and Irony in Hitchcock's Films. So this is a full-on critical analysis uh, focusing primarily on several key works, but uh, basically talking about the love stories or sometimes lack of love stories or, uh, you know, not uh, or atypical love stories and how that relates to Hitchcock's work. So again, not really very many stills, but... Uh, what I like about this is it uses uh, some of the lesser discussed films, like I Confess, for example, uh, which are really great, but they're not often as used as the you know most famous four or five pictures that are in every book. So if there's ever a good critical work that uses some of the lesser regarded films, which are still masterpieces, uh, then I get very excited. So Charlotte Chandler strikes again. This is her book on Hitchcock, titled It's Only a Movie. Um, a pretty good, straightforward biography, not super, super long. Again, if you're looking for a starter book on Hitchcock, this is pretty good if you're just looking for the biographical details. And again, the cover's pretty nice and has this nice, fancy uh, matte jacket. This one I read when I was a kid, and again, I think it's actually really essential. Um, this is David Freeman's book, The Last Days of Everett Hitchcock. This is about uh, David Freeman was a young screenwriter who was working with Hitchcock on what was going to be his next film after Family Plot, entitled The Short Night. And unfortunately, it never came to fruition. So uh, Freeman publishes the screenplay, which uh, is the second half of this book. But the first half is a personal memoir about 
working with Hitchcock in his office and how Hitchcock was acting and feeling with his declining health in his later years. So um, this is pretty much no holds barred and doesn't pull any punches and showing just, uh, you know, how um, debilitated that Hitchcock had gotten uh, in his later years and how he was still trying to make films um, and struggling with being, uh, you know, on the board of MCA Universal, but not necessarily having the clout that uh, he deserved and being able to choose and make his own projects. So um, if you ever wondered about Hitchcock's final final years, um, this, this is the most detailed account uh, of that from somebody who was actually there. And again, the entirety of the Short Night screenplay is in here. So if you were ever curious about what the Short Night would have been like, uh, it's it's all in here. So this this is just one of the you know five or ten essential Hitchcock books. This again is another critical work on Hitchcock that um, I haven't read in a while, but I found this nice copy uh, again in the used bookstore not too long ago. So I'm interested to reread it. Um, this is entitled Hitchcock's America. It's a series of critical pieces basically talking about everything in the um, American idiom or the Americana in Hitchcock films, primarily the films of the 40s and 50s he made once he was here in the States. And that's something that doesn't get covered very often. Um, you know, the British films are more talked about now at least, but they're still not talked about in the way that the more famous American films are. Um, but there is interesting, um, interesting things to note, particularly in the early American films, as you see Hitchcock not only discovering how the American studio system worked, uh, but really discovering how the American idiom uh, worked in in a lot of different ways, and it develops over time. So I, I think this book is a really great uh, idea, um, and again, it's just various critical essays by different uh, writers. But uh, I, I remember it being very good, so I'm interested to reread it. But just the idea and the uh, concept behind this book, I think, is extremely sound. Now we come to the big one. If you were to have one book on Hitchcock, it should be this one. This is Patrick McGilligan's uh, biography, A Life, of, A Life in Darkness and Light. Uh, I think this is the definitive Hitchcock book. Um, it doesn't pull any punches. It is a really nice, thick tome. Um, it's one of the best uh, film biographies or film director biographies out there for sure. And again, if you were to pick up one book on Hitchcock, you should make it this one. This is the most uh, well-researched, um, most probably, I, I think it's the most accurate. I think it's the best written of all the Hitchcock biographies. And again, it covers both the ups and the downs and uh, covers the later years very, very well, which is a period most people don't get into very well. And it has some extremely nice stills in a pretty well-packed center still section. So you can also get this paperback version usually for very, very cheap. So I, I would absolutely insist if you are interested in picking up any of these books in this video, um, you should probably start with this one. It is the Hitchcock tome of all tomes. This next one, again, is another critical collection, but um, I thought it was interesting due to its focus primarily on a number of the British films. Uh, it's another one of those where they focus on a handful of films and then have, very, have uh, various critical pieces about it. So this is the book entitled Hitchcock of the Murderous Gaze, with a nice cheeky photo of, of Hitch there. Um, but again, I like that this book has some lesser-known films focused on, so you have The Lodger, uh, but it also has Murder and The 39 Steps, and then the more famous films Shadow of a Doubt and Psycho. But um, again, the stills referenced in the text are really great because a lot of times um, the text will be going on about various scenes, and then um, you know it really helps if you have something representing that there so you can put in your mind's eye exactly what they're talking about and it's it's a pretty lengthy work it, it clocks in at over 300 pages and uh it was it was actually a nice read and it's very uncommon for me to be able to read a book on hitchcock and read all these critical pieces and come across something new or something not pretentious or something that hasn't already been said a thousand times over so i this was a, a nice find in the local shop this one is one of those books that's basically been replaced by the internet, um, but it does have some nice uh, pieces about the films and a little bit of background detail, but it's basically like an encyclopedia slash filmography. So it's literally called Hitchcock, the Definitive Filmography. 
but it was a really nice condition book and the used shop for literally less than a dollar. So of course I'm going to pick it up. And um, it's also got some listings of uh, not just books on Hitchcock at the time, but also various articles, uh, particularly a lot of the classic Cahiers du Cinema pieces by Truffaut and Chabral and Godard. So I thought that was a really nice touch. And then again, each film has at least a page or two write up on it. So again, not something necessarily essential and you can find all this stuff on the internet, but it's nice that it was all published in book form. And now we come to the major book that most people talk about in reference for Hitchcock that I find is so full of inaccuracies and hearsay and conjectures that I really have major problems with this, but yet I own two copies of it. Go figure. And that, of course, is Donald Spoto's uh, Dark Side of Genius, The Life of Alfred Hitchcock. This is an older edition that uh, was given to me by somebody, so I just kept it because it has uh, some different stills in here as compared to the later version. But uh, you should definitely just, if you're going to pick it up, grab the later edition, which looks like this, uh, which has a little bit of extra writing, and the stills are a little different. Um, I mean, this book, it, it's inspired so much of Hitchcock criticism and scholarship that you really can't get away from it. But again, uh, especially compared to the McGilligan book, I mean, if you read both McGilligan's book and then this photo book, um, you, especially if you read them back to back, you're really going to scratch your head reading this because a lot of this is just like critical theory, but written as if it was a biography. And I find that really infuriating because I read this as a kid growing up and, uh, but it seemed kind of weird. And then I kept reading more and more and more and only realized that Spoto basically put all this in a book and it, it got lauded for it. And so many classes and so much scholarship is based around this book still to this day. And it really has just a lot of stuff that didn't really happen that way or is just conjecture. So I have major issues with this book. But again, it's one of the first really big popular books that was a film biography. Um, the book he, he wrote that's actually a lot better uh, is entitled The Art of Alfred Hitchcock. This is one of the older editions, but this is simply about the films, and it's a critical book, and it's a heck of a lot better because it doesn't pretend to be a freaking biography. Um, and, of course, most people don't talk about this and have never read it, but it's a lot better because it's a critic writing critically instead of trying to make a biography. And the stills are really nice, even though they're all black and white. So um, it, you should definitely check this out if you're looking for another great critical book on Hitchcock. But you, you can't get away from Dark Side of Genius. But I, I really, I really hate what this book did to the Hitchcock legend and the Hitchcock um, scholarship field. And again, most people don't take the time to realize that a lot of this stuff is really a crock of crap. <laughs> Um, this should also go hand in hand with the McGillingham book. It's really the first classic book on Hitchcock. It's one of the books that made uh, film scholarship be taken seriously uh, because it was written and composed during the height of the French New Wave. But this, is, of course, is the iconic Hitchcock Truffaut book based around their legendary conversations where Truffaut professed his love for Hitchcock, who had never been taken properly or seriously up to that point. And uh, it is just... One of those incredible pieces of work that's a time capsule in a lot of ways, but it's amazing to see Hitchcock be so enthralled that somebody so brilliant and talented actually not only took his work so seriously, but uh, took his work for the greatness that it actually was when Hitchcock himself was you know, just treated as a showman. But it goes through uh, roughly the entire career up to that point in the early 1960s. And then this is the revised edition where Truffaut wrote a postscript about the later films. So definitely pick up this copy with the gray cover of the revised edition. Um, a lot of the recordings have now been released as extras, and you can actually just find them on the Internet. Um, but uh, they're usually just kind of raw, unedited. And, of course, uh, Truffaut had a really great translator who understood film terminology there. So it was just the three of them in a room. But uh, this, this book is invaluable. It's, far wor it's worth its weight in gold a thousand times over. It's one of the five or ten best books on motion pictures ever written. And uh, simply for importance alone, it may be the best uh, because, it, again, 
was the first book read by, you know, uh, a lot of people who were not PhD candidates in motion picture studies uh, that actually discussed the art of motion pictures seriously and Hitchcock himself seriously. So this is the book that really started to turn people's heads around and make them take his work seriously instead of just dismissing it as a mere popular entertainment. Then the last Hitchcock book that I have a copy of is a revised version. Well, it's called Revisited. But anyway, this is the revised version of Robin Wood's book, Hitchcock Films. So definitely check out this version, uh, Hitchcock's Films Revisited. Uh, Robin Wood being, of course, one of the great uh, British film critics of the 60s and 70s. Uh, wrote a lot about important directors, but his, his work on Hitchcock really was... I don't know if it was the first book he technically had published, but it was like one of the first major ones that uh, got him well known. And it's a really, really well written, well thought out piece of work. Kind of goes hand in hand with the Hitchcock Truffaut book in a lot of ways. And I was happy to pick up this version because it has two nice still sections and then a whole bunch of extra materials written later. So it's a lot thicker than the original book and gets into some of the later films. So definitely find this later revised version. Then to finish out the H's, we move on to the Houston family. This one I just picked up recently, um, actually not too long ago, but uh, it's a interesting looking memoir by Angelica Houston about her younger days growing up in Europe. And I really like the cover art very much. So I just figured this would be a interesting read. I think she's a very interesting individual. And of course, being such a fan of her dad, uh, of course, you know, the more you can find out about the family, the more interesting it becomes. And speaking of that, I have the big tome on the Houston family, simply entitled The Houstons. I've had this for years and years, so it's been a long time since I've read it, but it's basically, you know, a biography of sorts, not just about John Houston, but the family as well. And it's quite large and filled with photographs. Here, of course, being... A picture of Walter Houston, the phenomenal legendary actor himself. So again, it's been a long time since I've read this, so I can't remember a whole, whole lot about the book itself. Uh, but basically anything in regards to John Houston, I practically devour. Um, I've read his autobiography, which is called An Open Book, which is really just exceptional. It was one of those I couldn't put down whatsoever um, until I finished it. But I haven't gotten like the really nice... Um, because I remember reading it, and I don't know if it had anything extra in it, but it was a much later reprinting that was a very nice, like, I don't know if it was a, it was a centennial edition, but I would like to get one of the later editions to just have on the shelf, because um, if you're a fan of John Houston at all, you should definitely read his autobiography. Um, but anyway, this, this, is a, this is a book you find in most used bookstores. I think it was written in the late 80s or early 90s, but it's about the whole family, which not many books will ever get into uh, the rest of the family outside of just the primarily famous individual. Well, thanks for checking out this section of my motion picture and entertainment biography section. Um, it's, it's really fun to go through these because it reminds me of books I've never gotten to or books I haven't read in a long time. Um, but you, you'd be surprised how much information is out there tucked away in, in biographies, especially for the field of motion pictures and actors, actresses, and the whole field of entertainment, really. Um, and it's really a, a field, I think, that gets overlooked, um, particularly in the you know more scholarly research section of things. So I've found I've learned more from reading biographies that are well-written and well-researched than most of the books on films out there, um, because usually they'll just be uh, collections of critical articles and things like that, or just be, you know, general information trivia books. Um, so I can't recommend, you know, a really good motion picture biography well enough, uh, because the information usually contained in there is it's usually not going to be found anywhere else unless you actually go and scour vaults and libraries and personal collections yourself. So anyway, um, this is just the second installment of the series. My shelves are quite long, because, quite large, because I can't pass up a cheap biography because I read too many biographies. So anyway, uh, definitely stay tuned for the next installment. I'm having to break it up so these videos don't get, you know, like several hours long. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks for checking this out. Hopefully you found a book that you either uh, want to go reread or find at your local library. A number of these are, are some of my all-time favorites, and I wish I had... 
all my favorite ones, but of course I have neither the space or the funds to be able to have every book I've ever liked. But uh, anyway, until next time, uh, keep reading great motion picture books uh, and finding all kinds of great information out there contained within the pages of such tomes. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody.